Article 1, Section 2 of the United States Constitution mandates a census to be taken every 10 years, counting the number of humans, but not yet AGI, living in the United States. So far, there have been 23 going on 24 such censuses, or maybe it's sensi, censuses. This is Data Skeptic Consensus, the 10th installment in our series about how multi-agent systems achieve collective decision-making. Today on the show, I speak with Simpson Garfinkel, senior computer scientist at the U.S. Census Bureau. He joins us to discuss disclosure avoidance systems, in particular, differential privacy. My name is Simpson Garfinkel. I am the Senior Computer Scientist for Confidentiality and Data Access at the U.S. Census Bureau. Could you give us maybe some high-level details to begin with about what that encompasses? What are some of your job roles and responsibilities? So I came to the U.S. Census Bureau in January 2017 with the goal of modernizing the Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance system. We use the term disclosure avoidance at the U.S. Census Bureau to describe any process that prevents an unauthorized disclosure of confidential information that is collected from respondents. And when we say respondents, we mean either individuals or business establishments. We have a legal obligation to not publish any data that would allow a person using those publications to determine the identity of the individual or the business establishment that provided us with that sensitive data. And we use a variety of mathematical techniques, which we call disclosure avoidance, to realize that duty. Now, we use the term disclosure avoidance, but other statistical agencies use the term statistical disclosure limitation. We use disclosure avoidance for decennial census, and that information is collected and published in a variety of forms, but the raw data is retained and published after 72 years. But we also use disclosure avoidance for the economic census, which happens every five years, and for more than 100 other data products that the U.S. Census Bureau publishes. I suspect there's good reason to not disclose some of your disclosure avoidance methodologies and techniques, but broadly speaking, what is the outgoing message about exactly what those mathematics are? Well, actually, one of the changes that I came to the Census Bureau to do was to move us from secret disclosure avoidance techniques to public disclosure avoidance techniques. We believe that in the interest of transparency, everything about the disclosure avoidance process should be public, should be auditable, and should be mathematically rigorous. That wasn't always the case. We used to use secret methods, and part of the privacy protection came from keeping those methods secret. But in the interest of public accountability, and also to move to a mechanism that is mathematically rigorous, we've decided to adopt differential privacy as our primary disclosure avoidance technique. And one of the advantages of differential privacy is that you can release all of the information about the technique that you are using, the source code that you are using. The only thing that has to remain confidential is the actual noise, the random numbers that are added to parts of the statistical processing to turn the confidential data into publicly publishable statistics. And this is similar to encryption, where you have a cryptographic key that keeps communication confidential. The difference is that in disclosure avoidance, once we make those random numbers and we use them for the purpose of making the data that we publish private, we then throw them away. We don't keep them around because they're no longer needed. So is that almost a uh, aspect of the security? I know if I encrypt something and throw away the encryption key, I've lost that information. Is it a similar motivation? It's the same idea. We want to make sure that once we make a publication, that those publications can't be reversed. And part of making sure that those publications can't be reversed is throwing away the actual noises. Now, one of the things that we're not going to throw away, though, is what we call the noisy measurements. After we take 
the confidential data and apply the differential privacy mechanism to it, the first data result is what we call the noisy measurements. And that's the raw data plus the noise added to it. We then do a lot of post-processing to turn those noisy measurements into things that look like our legacy statistics, the tables that we traditionally published in 2010 and 2000. Now, unfortunately, due to a lot of mathematical requirements, those final publications are less accurate than the noisy measurements. So we want to move to a world where we're publishing the noisy measurements and publishing the final statistics. Right now, there have been some criticisms of the use of differential privacy in the 2020 census because data users have rightfully looked at the final measurements and have said that they are not as accurate as they were in 2010. And of course, the reason they're not as accurate as they were in 2010 is that in 2010, we didn't use differential privacy and the results that we published were too accurate. But with noisy measurements, end data users could get the same level of accuracy they require. They might even be able to get more accuracy than they got in 2010. And we can talk about that. But the noisy measurements are in a form that data users are not used to working with. And so one of the key aspects of moving to differential privacy is that it is a more complex environment than we've used in 2010. And we're also sharing all the details. And so for our data users, they're not used to this level of complexity and they're also not used to this level of transparency. So let me tell you what we did in 2010. So we would take the data from the census unedited file and that includes responses from respondents and that also includes some information from administrative records. And that also includes proxy responses, and it includes some amount of imputation for when we didn't get responses, but we know that there's somebody living there. And we run it through an editing process. And that editing process looks for responses that don't make any sense. For example, if you said that you live with your daughter and you're 33 years old and your daughter is 66 years old, we know that that's not mathematically possible. And so that would be edited. We then, in 2010, had a different disclosure avoidance process, which we call swapping. And what the swapping system did is it looked for people who were identifiable, for example, just one family living on a block, and it would swap some of their attributes with another family or another household somewhere else. And the details of how that works, we don't actually release because part of that confidentiality mechanism depends upon the details not being made public. So one of the things that happened in 2010 that isn't happening in 2020 is that there was this swapping happening in this undocumented way that would make it harder for an attacker to identify people living on single blocks, for example. And that caused data quality problems also. Recently, the Census Bureau published a report comparing the impact of the swapping mechanism and the impact of the 2020 mechanism and found that we actually have less distortion in the data in 2020 than in 2010 for certain kinds of measurements. And I expect that over the next few months as the 2020 differential privacy system continues to be improved, that will be even better than we were in 2010. So would it be fair to say that that swapping technique was a disclosure avoidance, maybe a legacy disclosure avoidance process, and that it seems to be differential privacy is how the census will move forward? Correct. The disclosure avoidance process for the 2000 and the 2010 census was swapping. And we have a report on the Census Bureau website which looks at the changes of disclosure avoidance techniques for the decennial census over the past few decennial censuses. And I know I'm a little late to the game on this question, but let's backtrack and start with what is a formal definition of differential privacy? What is this cool technique? I'm not going to give you the formal definition because that's a mathematical formula, but I can give you intuition about the mathematical formula. So the idea of differential privacy, which was invented by Cynthia Dork in 2005 and first published in a paper by Cynthia Dork and McSherry and Nissen and Smith in 2006, the idea is that your privacy can't be compromised if the data product doesn't include your data. 
So differential privacy looks at the contribution to a final statistic that your data might have, and it adds an amount of noise that's roughly equivalent to your data for any you that might possibly exist in the input universe. And I say that it adds an amount of noise approximately equal to your data, but that's at one setting of this value that we call epsilon, or the privacy loss budget. So with differential privacy, we actually have a knob that we can use to adjust the trade-off between the privacy loss that each individual might maximally suffer and the accuracy of the resulting statistics. And we can set that trade-off so that there's a lot of privacy loss, but the statistics are very accurate. And we can set it so that there's no privacy loss, in which case the statistics don't actually represent any of the data that's collected. Epsilon can go from zero to infinity. At zero, there's no privacy loss, but there's no information in the output data. And at infinity, there's infinite privacy loss, and we basically publish the raw data. And so I like the fact that there is one knob and we can probably optimize for the right value of it. But how do we go about deciding on the best epsilon we should pick? So there's actually many knobs because after that first question of what should the privacy loss budget be, there's then a question of where do we allocate it? Do we allocate the privacy loss to, say, male-female queries or to queries about a person's age or about the relationship status? So there's a lot of policy questions about where to allocate the privacy loss. And there's also the policy question about how much privacy loss should be allocated in general. Now, for the 2020 census, we know that the privacy loss has to be sufficient to allow for the intended statistical purposes of the 2020 census, but that there shouldn't be privacy loss beyond that. And that decision is made by the Census Bureau lead policy group, which is the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, a committee that's headed by the chief operating officer, who is a government career civil servant, and most of the leaders of the Census Bureau sit on that body. And I'm curious about the degree to which the noise impacts the data set. You'd mentioned that, you know, there's been different disclosure avoidance techniques in the past. I suspect if we looked into the history, there's an exciting evolution of stuff. And maybe that'll continue to go on, as you said, with differential privacy. If I were some sort of forensic statistician, could I look at the censuses and figure out when the techniques shifted? Are things sensitive at that level? So... We decided to move to differential privacy after the 2010 census, and the official announcement was made in 2017. But the Census Bureau has been using differential privacy since around 2008. The Census Bureau was actually the first organization on the planet to make use of differential privacy. And in that deployment, being the first doesn't always mean it's the easiest path. Could you talk about some of the challenges of adopting it? The biggest challenge that we have had is being on the leading edge of the transition of this technology from the research laboratories into practice. And a whole lot of technology had to be developed to do that. The technique that we're using for differential privacy requires a lot of computer effort, not to implement the differential privacy, but to do that post-processing. The differential privacy is lightweight computationally. You could do it on a laptop for the entire 2020 census. But the post-processing that we do to make that consistent set of statistics that are the legacy publication system, for that we have a cluster with more than a thousand cores running for more than 36 hours. So being able to do that required changing policies within the Census Bureau about using Amazon computing with the confidential data. It also required assembling a team that could build and test that system. It's also required socializing differential privacy within the Census Bureau and to our data user community. Those have all required a lot of effort. Thanks to this week's sponsor, BetterHelp. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. BetterHelp is professional online counseling. You can start communicating with a counselor in under 24 hours. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can connect in a safe and private online environment. 
can send a message to your counselor anytime and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. You can also schedule a weekly video or phone session. All of this without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. If you want to start living a happier life today, as a listener of Data Skeptic, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash dataskeptic. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash dataskeptic. It's a new technique, so I imagine some of that socialization comes with education as well. Are there any recommendations you have for people to get started on that process of learning about this technique and how to deploy it? And I guess as well, how to work with the statistics that were generated within the paradigm? Yeah, so there is a Minute Physics video that we worked with them to produce, and it has a broad overview of how differential privacy works. There's a Wikipedia article on differential privacy, which is okay, and it references some other tutorials. The basic idea of differential privacy, the way we've implemented it, I can describe right here. If I'm thinking of my age, and I say I'm going to add a random number between negative 5 and 5 to my age, and then I tell you I'm 52 years old, you don't really know how old I am. You know a range of my age. And if I say that number between negative five and five, it actually might be bigger than five and it might be smaller than negative five. There's only a 95% chance it's within negative five and five. Then there's even more possibilities for my age. Now, you can imagine that if we asked a thousand people their age and we took each of those ages and we added between negative five and five to each one of those ages and then we took all the numbers and we averaged them together, all of those noises would average out over time and we would get a fairly accurate average of the average of everybody's age. And that's sort of the way differential privacy works. In fact, it's exactly the way differential privacy works in something called the local model. And we are using differential privacy in a different model called the trusted curator model. And in that version, you take everybody's age and you add them all up and then you add the randomness between negative five and five. And then you divide the whole thing by a thousand because I said you asked a thousand people. You can imagine with your mind in the first version, we had a thousand random numbers between negative five and five. We added them all and then divided. In the second version, we just had one random number between negative five and five and divided by a thousand. So in this simple example that I've given you, the trusted curator model gives you a thousand times better accuracy than what we call the local model. So most of the experience that people outside of the Census Bureau have with differential privacy, and most of the intuition is this local model, the idea that you take each person's census response and you add random noise to that and work with that. And from my simple example, you can understand that that does not give the most accurate results. The most accurate results come after you've done your data processing, then you add the noise, and therefore the amount of noise that's added is much less. When the census is published, part of what's cool about it is literally anyone can use it. So I'm sure the census has no idea of the various ways. I mean, you have some idea, but I'm sure there are clever people out there who have done interesting things you don't know about that they rely on the census in some way. Would you expect, just given the broad number of use cases, that there's anybody out there whose analysis or use case would be sensitive to the introduction of differential privacy? You know, somebody, a hedge fund suddenly going to turn upside down because their algorithm no longer works. That's an excellent question. There's a publicly available uh, statistic, which I've, you can find online, that estimates there's $1.5 trillion of federal benefits that are allocated using the decennial census. And we use it for calibrating other surveys. And we know that it's used widely within the, the U.S. business community. The error that's introduced with the differential privacy mechanism when the noisy measurements are used is going to be considerably less than the error introduced in the 2010 census with the swapping mechanism. We already have a scientific result from one of our census centers that gives us that result. The error that's introduced in the official 
data products at this point is unclear because that decision hasn't been made by the DSA, the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee. Now, will this have a major impact on some hedge fund? Probably not. Would this have an impact on a school system that might be citing where the next school goes? Well, that depends on how they use our data. If they use the data with an understanding of how differential privacy works, they'll be able to use the data more accurately with the 2020 data than they could with the 2010 data. But it really requires them stepping up to the plate to use the new data the way that they'll get the best results. So the overall motivation, I guess, is to maintain privacy. You know, the census has this challenge of the whole goal is to collect data and release it, not to collect it and encrypt it and keep it private. So privacy is paramount. Are these proactive efforts you're working on or is there a villain here who has done something in the past that now you have to armor up our defenses a bit? There are many adversaries in data publishing from a statistical agency's point of view. The biggest adversary that we have is the reluctance of the public to provide us with their data. So we need to be very strong data stewards to really protect their confidentiality in order to retain the trust of the American people. And there are organizations out there, inside and outside the United States, that don't want the census to succeed. You know, there are many, many organizations that are wishing ill on the United States. And so we don't want to be making data publications that an adversary could use to say, look, the Census Bureau isn't protecting your privacy. Surprisingly, another adversary are academics within the U.S. academic community and the foreign academic community. There is a a cottage industry of assistant professors that take official publications and publications from corporations and try to find private information in them and get papers out of this. And this is a way that professors gain status. And this is a way that the state of the art and privacy protection is advanced. And we don't want the data publications of the Census Bureau to be somebody's PhD thesis or somebody's paper at a conference showing how they undid all of our privacy protection mechanisms. The uh, post-processing aspects of differential privacy make perfect sense to me as someone who's used to reading statistics papers and understanding some of the math and computational challenges behind it. But I think to maybe someone uninformed and conspiracy-minded, that could sound like some secret black box where the data goes in, gets corrupted, and something bad comes out the other end. Could you talk a little bit about the openness of the project and the process and the algorithms that would alleviate a concern like that? Yeah, sure. So the first thing I'll say is that we have telegraphed our intention to publish the noisy measurements. We've already published all of our source code. And so you can take our source code right now and see how it works. And there are consultants outside the Census Bureau who are not on our payroll who have done this. I'll give you an example of how the noisy measurements might produce odd looking data and then how the post-processing makes that look normal. So let's say there are four blocks and each of the blocks for simple Simplicity has five people living on it. So in this hypothetical example, there are 20 people. And let's say that after the noise is applied, we find that there's five people, six people, negative five people, and like 15 people, okay? So when all those numbers are added up, if I did my math right, we'll still end up with 20 people. Actually, I think we get 21 with the way I did the numbers, but we have a block there with negative five people on it. Now, we can't say that there are negative five people in a block because that wouldn't make sense. And from a lot of official purposes, that's kind of a weird result. So what the post-processing algorithm will do is it will take those numbers, and I think it's 5, 6, negative 5, and 10, and add them together. And then it has a, a measurement for the block group as a whole, which it also added noise to. So that block group as a whole, that measurement was originally 20. And once it gets the noise added, it might be 22. So then the post-processing algorithm works with these measurements and it makes sure that the block measurements add up to 22. And to do that in this example, we're probably going to end up with a block that has only one or two people on it. And we're going to end up with a block that has maybe nine people on it. It's probably not going to make them all equal to five, which is what our input was. Now, 
if I'm looking at individual blocks, I say, oh, look, you got a block there with one person on it. And obviously it doesn't have one person on it. It has five people on it. You screwed up. But again, think about that school district. If they could work with the noisy measurements and, and look at them, then they could get a more accurate view because they're going to draw the blocks that they want to use. And then they're going to add up the noisy measurements for those blocks themselves. They're not going to use the post-processed results. And I suppose if it was super important at a hyper local level, I could go out and do some counting. Would I gain any advantage in that, you know, limited ground truth measurement to reverse engineer anything? Well, let's say two things. First, if you go out and try to count, you're not going to be assured of getting the correct numbers any more than we're assured of getting the correct numbers. But we're going to spend a lot more money counting than you will. And we are also able to look at administrative records and we can go to ask the neighbors. So for any significant block, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to conduct an accurate census on that block. But you might. Let's say that you do have access to ground truth. Let's say you break into our computers and steal some of the raw data that one of the aspects of differential privacy is that you cannot, you mathematically cannot determine the values of the data that you didn't steal from the data that you did steal and the results that we publish. And that's because we're using those random numbers, that random noise, and then throwing the raw noise away. We keep the noisy measurements, but we throw away the random numbers that we added to the true data. We also keep the true data. We'll release that in 72 years. So it doesn't matter if you have external data. It doesn't matter if your computers get faster, if better algorithms are developed. There's a mathematical proof that the privacy guarantees of differential privacy cannot be undone by advances in technology or computer power or the release of additional data. Now, it's important to realize that differential privacy doesn't give absolute guarantees on privacy. It gives relative guarantees on privacy. If you knew the number of people who lived on a block and then I make my data release and my data release is private, you still know how many people live on that block. There's no way that I can make an absolute guarantee when I make a data publication about the privacy of the people who live on that block. I can only make a guarantee that my release will not add more to the privacy loss that those people have already suffered as a result of living in the world and the other data publications that are already out there. Well, usually before I go into a wrap-up, I like to ask, is there anything you think I should have asked that we didn't get to? Well, you could ask, is it fun working at the Census Bureau? And do we have any jobs available? And the answer is, yes, it's a lot of fun. And we are actively looking to hire data scientists. And you should go to the, the census.gov website and usajobs.gov and find information there. It's a great place to be. It's actually one of the best work environments I've ever been at. What are some of the skill sets and challenges that that data scientist is going to have? So data scientists at the Census Bureau, we're, we're very much looking for people who know the Python programming language. To get a job at the Census Bureau, you need to have had a certain amount of mathematics and statistics in your undergraduate curriculum or be able to demonstrate that you've taken those courses. It's good to have knowledge of modern data management techniques. It's good to have visualization capabilities. We use the Git source code control system. We also have people who are doing visualizations on the front end, and that's done with JavaScript and a number of visualization libraries. We also have people who specialize in survey questions because we run a lot of surveys. So people who know about survey methodology, we're looking for people who know how to conduct focus groups. We have many, many job categories at the Census Bureau just in data science alone. Well, exciting stuff. We'll have links to some of that in the show notes. And I'll also add, I can recommend for those potential applicants they read, in addition to the resources you provided, they should check out Issues Encountered Deploying Differential Privacy, the paper you're a lead author on that covers a lot of the ideas we've been discussing today. I will have a link to that as well. And we also just brought out randomness concerns when deploying differential privacy. And that's our concerns about our random number generator. Oh, fabulous. I'm actually really interested in random number generators. That's going to go to the top of my stack. So if you basically Google for randomness and my name, Simpson Garfinkel, and census, it should be the first hit. Excellent. Well, I'll be on that this afternoon. Simpson, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your experience and expertise. Yeah, thanks for doing this. This was a fun interview. 
That concludes this installment of Data Skeptic Consensus. Our guest today was Simpson Garfinkel. Our theme song is Paradox by Oddly. Claudia Armbruster is our associate producer. Vanessa Bursiaga does guest coordination. And I've been your host, Kyle Polich. <laughs>